Hear the promises of God. I am the resurrection and the life. All who believe in me, though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious hand. Family and friends, we gather here in the protective shelter of God's healing love. We are free to pour out our grief, release our anger, face our emptiness, and know that God cares. We gather here as God's people, aware of others who have died and of the frailty of our own existence upon this earth. We come to comfort and to support one another in our common loss. We gather to hear God's words of hope that drives away our despair and moves us to offer God our praise. We gather to commend to God with thanksgiving the life of Betty Houseman. For whether we live or whether we die, we belong to Christ, who is Lord both of the dead and of the living. Let's pray. Our God, it's a mixture of things. I don't know if I've ever been in Littleton's and all the way back in the lounge heard people laughing, but I heard it today. Reminiscing and enjoying, laughing and crying, a beautiful life, a beautiful friend, a beautiful person who influenced us, who loved us deeply with a disarming love that had a way of getting in the nooks and crannies of our hearts to bring laughter and healing and hope and faith and love. Our God, we grieve, but we certainly grieve in the hope of the resurrection. We know we'll see her again. And so while we shed tears, there's a whole lot of gratitude and a whole lot of celebration today in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, a couple family members are going to come. Trevor's going to read some scripture, and Esther's going to share some thoughts, and then I'm going to open it up. So after Esther speaks, if there's anything that you want to share from where you're at, or if you want to come up behind the lectern and share your thoughts from up here, uh, you'll be given that opportunity after they share. So Esther, Trevor. This may not seem very organized, but, you know, as we've sat and talked about mom with this being so unexpected, we've heard so many stories, but amazingly, when you need to write them down, you can't think of all of them because she was full of them. She was full of it, as a matter of fact. So she, she got funnier and funnier as she got older. Betty Lou Souders Houseman, almost 95. She missed her birthday by two days. So for all essential purposes, 95. A daughter, wife, mother, sister, grandmother, and great-grandmother, and friend, passed away Friday, January 22, 2021. Over the years, she told many stories of growing up on the farm near Cable and also going to her grandparents' farm in Wellston. She learned early hospitality and caring for others. Her mom would always set another plate out if someone visited at mealtime. Betty was one of six children and would laugh and remind us that she was her dad's favorite. When her mom would ground her, she'd go to her dad and ask to go out with her friends, and he'd not only let her go, but would slip her a quarter so she could go roller skating. She knew she had daddy where she wanted him. She and her friends stole her dad's wagon one night. They needed to get to town to get hot dogs for a wiener roast, and they put the wagon back where it was supposed to be. The next day, her dad got up, went back in to talk to Hazel, his wife, her mom, and said, I think somebody stole my wagon last night. And Hazel said, well, why would somebody do that? I don't think Mom let on. Another time she talked about belling some newly married friends. And for those of us that were way too young to know what belling was, they used to put the newlyweds in the back of a truck and then bang on pans. Don't ask me. I'm kind of glad that, that went away. But anyway, so they had been out belling married friends. And her mom found a cigar on her nightstand. She asked Betty, what are you doing with this? She admitted to smoking it because of the celebration. 
Hazel, her mom, said, I suppose if they were all going to jump in the river, you would too. Betty replied, I probably would. One Sunday after church, her she was walking home, and her older brother, her oldest brother, Andy, caught her walking home with friends and smoking. He told her, get in the truck. He said if he's caught her smoking again, he would tell their dad. Andy was the one always looking out for her. Betty and Cliff were married in 1946, and then she received two of her greatest gifts, her boys, her greatest joys, Rick and Ron. I'm pretty sure, with all the times that we all know she laughed, I'm pretty sure the boys could think of times when she wasn't laughing so hard. She delighted in her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren. She just liked people. She worked hard, she made friends easily, enjoy, and enjoyed life in general. She accepted changes in life many times over, and then after retirement, moved to Florida. She and Dad loved to travel. They would come home by, home by way of Branson, Missouri. They made friends of the entertainers and went back to see them as their friends. They made friends everywhere. They were always glad to see family and friends, after losing her husband of 61 years and caring for him during his illness, she moved back to Springfield to Green Lawn Village, again making all new friends. She loved being in a community of people her own age. She enjoyed lunches and activities and pajama breakfast parties with the girls. She moved in with us after a brief il illness. We loved her stories and delighted in her energy. She was al always ready for a meal, a hot cookie, or a nap. Even more, she loved the kids when they stopped by. She would giggle and tease as they entertained her. She found joy in many places and always because of those she was with. Well, I have to tell you one story. When I was pregnant, seven or eight months pregnant, I got out of the car and stepped in a hole and fell down. She laughed so hard, she couldn't help me up, and I sat there on the ground with my leg in this hole, but I never knew when she started laughing when you were going to get her to stop. She was just one happy lady. She broke her hip, and she moved to Forest Glen. She once again hit her stride, new people, nurses, aides, news and brews. You never knew what she would say, and you never knew what she would do. And little would do we know that Greg would teach her sign language. Mom always had a great disposition. She laughed easily and thoroughly enjoyed her home at Forest Glen. She loved her new family and friends, and she knew she was loved. The hardest part of the pandemic for her was being isolated, but she never complained. But she did continue to ask us to please come inside. We were thankful to be able to visit at the window, though she missed the hugs. We want to thank all of her caregivers at Forest Glen. We know she loved them. She loved them, she lo and they loved her. She could never remember what she had for the last meal, but she could always remember who loved her. We will all miss her terribly. Found a, just yesterday, a, just some prose that is called Live Well. And I think this is what the, what the message is that she would want us to take with us. Don't rush through life. It is a journey, not a race. Trust in, trust in the goodness of people. Work harder than everyone else. Forgive and forget. Tell someone that you love them every day. Be honest and kind. Make time to go to church and remember to say your prayers. Laugh whenever you can and leave your worries behind. Be honorable. Live today like it was your last. We'll miss her. It's 23, right? Okay. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet, water, quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
at this time, I open it up if anyone would like to share a memory from where you're at or come up, up front and, and share with us. <laughs> whatever, whatever hot coffee is, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, and then the second one was probably Esther and Kelly and I were talking about in the last few days. Um, I don't know how long it's been, but she ended up, she, she and I were together, I don't know, and um, somebody was going somewhere else, and I was going back to the house, and I had this notion that we would go together. And uh, it was a little bit hungry, so we went to Tony's Corner. right next to us and they had no interview and Sam was next to him, went over and knocked on the door, knocked on the door and nobody saw him. And then finally, Randy opened the door like he was walking up because he had gotten the afternoon. And she's like, can I use the bathroom? And he's like, okay, sure. <laughs> All right, go ahead. So she goes and goes to the bathroom. These guys come back to the house and nobody knows where we are. And finally, they come go and find out that Sam had been in there. So <laughs> Would anyone else like to share? I'd like to read for you um, from the wisdom literature of the Bible, the book of Ecclesiastes in the third chapter. There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to tear down and a time to build up a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing, a time to search and a time to give up as lost, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to speak and a time to be silent. I have seen the task which God has given humanity with which to occupy themselves. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that humanity will not be able to figure out the work which God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better than for humanity to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime to see good in all of his labor. It is a gift from God. 
So Betty was my rabbi. In the Western tradition, we often think in terms of pastors, and we think in terms of theology and doctrine and Bible study and that sort of thing, at least in my tradition. And in the Jewish tradition, um, the rabbi is more one who helps you do life with God. And that's what Betty was for me. It's amazing the timing, as the wisdom literature says, of when God brings certain people into your life and how they affect your life and for how long they're in your life and you're in their life. It's a mystery. But God is the one who is weaving together the tapestry of history and weaves our lives together with his wisdom and his understanding. So having my life wound together, together with Betty's for over a decade has been quite a gift. Um, and so she taught me a lot. In the book of 1 Timothy, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, is mentoring a local church pastor whose name is Timothy. And in chapter 5, he says to him, Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father, to the younger men as brothers, to older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters in all purity. Honor widows who are widows indeed. But if any widow has children or grandchildren... They must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. I've watched you guys do that, and it has been an honor for me. I'm like you, Rick. I'm a thousand miles from my parents, and an occasional visit and a phone call is practicing that piety and relationship with my parents, and I've watched you guys, with her moving back from Florida into the community, rallying around her, living your faith, living your love, sharing life, the joys, the sorrows, the twists and turns. It's doing life God's way. And so it was my privilege to be Betty's favorite son, to move in <laughs> to relationship with her. You knew I was going to slip that in. <laughs> We did not drink that Bud Light that was in the picture. No hot toddies while I was at work anyway. We did a lot of laughing, a lot of teasing, a lot of picking on you two and family pictures that were in the room, a lot of reminiscing, just a lot of learning how to do life. And in the midst of all of the teasings and all of the conversations, um, Betty and I went deep. We, we talked about life. Being a, a son, having brothers, um, growing up in the shadow of John Wayne and the real men don't take crap off from anybody and the whole macho stuff of what it means to be a man in America of your generation and my generation and the people who influenced us and the way that it causes you to think about your identity. But yet as a boy, to know that mom is beautiful and mom is good and mom is strong, even though society bullies and mocks and shames you if you run like a girl or throw like a girl or punch like a girl. And to be a boy growing up, trying to hold these two things in tandem, that I want the men's approval in my life, but I know that mom and femininity is beautiful and I yearn to be held and loved by mom, how do I live in this tension of trying to impress the men and welcome the tenderness and the love that my heart yearns for? And so as a kid growing up and becoming a man, you learn to live in contradiction and justify it somehow in your mind of being a man in America. Well, now being in my 50s and meeting Betty in my 40s and being able to talk with her about this journey because one of the things that I did in my mind is women just don't understand. That was one of the lies I let myself believe that women don't see what's really going on. That whole lie 
that men are sneaky and women don't really know what's going on and women are weak and men are strong and all of that stuff that you struggle with to make sense in life. It was my privilege to sit with Betty and just open up like a disciple would to a rabbi and to learn that Father God has a mother's heart and that in my relationship with God, everything is brought together. And Betty was able to talk with me about everything she saw and everything that she knew, all of the games that were going on in life that she didn't allow poison her, that she chose not to play the game, but to live love, even though people may have thought she didn't know what was going on or didn't understand what was going on or was naive to what was going on. Betty knew life. She knew people. She knew the games. And it was my privilege to be able to unpackage my games with Betty. She's a lot like my mother. My mom's not nearly this spicy. I do want to name that. <laughs> She's got some spice. But maybe if my pastor sat with my mom, or her pastor, I should say, sat with her, and in these settings was able to unpackage some of my mom's stuff, he would see things that I never saw. Your mom is a beautiful and strong woman, a wise woman who knows us and knows life and chose to love, chose to forgive, chose to give God room to work in situations rather than meddle in situations or push or coerce in situations. And so while people like me perceive it as being naive or passive, she helped me understand its wisdom in action, its love being lived in a way that I don't understand it and haven't practiced it. And so Betty greatly contributed to my personal life journey, my understanding of myself and of God and of humanity and of life. And so I feel great peace sharing that with you, being rather transparent with you, as through this time of our lives being woven together, she enhanced my journey. God allowed, caused, whatever language you want to use for these things to happen, for his good, for my good, for her good, for our good in the mystery of our lives. And so I invite you to ponder. I invite you to pray. I invite you to open yourself to someone that may not naturally be your friend or an accountability partner or someone you open up with, someone who's considerably older than you are, who sees life very differently than you do, and cultivate a friendship and open your heart and welcome their heart and let God do a mysterious awakening. In the Old Testament, there's a word, Shema. The Shema is that classic Jewish statement, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's that hear part of it, the Shema, listen. It's not just the surface listening. It's sitting with someone and pondering, going deep in the consideration of motives and experiences and influences of beliefs and how those beliefs are lived out. And so she was my Shema partner. We talked a lot. We laughed a lot. We cried on occasion, and it was good. And I'm going to miss her. I know you're going to miss her for your own given reasons. I assure you, she deeply loved you guys. She carried you in her heart. 
And so thank you for sharing life with her and sharing her with me and our community. Amen. I invite you to turn your attention to a song that was selected, Amazing Grace. Should be familiar to you. She's an amazing gift of grace. To sum up, Betty taught me that you can complain about the time you're given or you can enjoy the time you're given. She chose to enjoy it and in love confronted me in my complaining. And I am in the midst of a transformation. I'm not Betty yet. Give me another 40 years and maybe I'll catch her both in age and in maturity, but she helped me get on the right road. 
and she bumped me in the right direction of thinking, of trusting God, doing life God's way, going deep into love, forgiving and letting go, not having to name everything that I see, but giving God space to work on people's hearts. A great rabbi, a great mentor in life. I love her. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you for the sharing of life, the speaking of truth from scripture, the speaking of truth and love from Betty. She has influenced us, you through her and you in her.